Hey guys, so I'm finally going to be doing a how to make a bezel set ring and I'm going to show you from start to finish how to make a bezel wall to creating a ring shank and everything in between. I'm going to try to make this not too chatty and really just a good tutorial for you guys. I'm going to do the best I can with the camera that I have and all that jazz and I hope that you enjoy it. Um, again, this is just the way I set rings. Not all rings are set like this and not everybody sets rings like I do. So. Take it with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to give you instruction on what I do. And I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more studio vlogs and things like that. So thank you for watching and let's get to it. As you can see on my bench, I have an assorted variety of bezel wires and I'm going to go through them really quickly then we're going to just jump right into what I'm going to be using. So you can get detailed uh, bezel which is like novelty specialty bezel wire which has this nice scalloped edging and you can get them in all sorts of heights as you can see one is higher than the other and you can get them in different gauges. I prefer 26 if I'm buying uh, pre like coiled bezel wire because it's just a nice durable substantial bezel without being too thick. Uh, definitely I think a good way to learn but if you're uncomfortable with thicker you can even try 28 which is even easier to smooth over and set the stone so this is a 3 16 of an inch uh, 26 gauge bezel and this is a 1 8 of an inch 26 gauge bezel and this is what we're going to be using today you can also buy uh, 14 karat gold you can buy copper this is some gold I have on hand I don't really stock gold I just buy it as needed so we're going to start with this. Now we're going to be doing a five millimeter labradorite stone. You can use any stone, really any size. If you want to do a 10 millimeter labradorite, you can certainly do that as well. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and show you how we're going to get started. So there's one of two ways that you can go about measuring how much metal you're going to need for this uh, bezel. For a round, you could just times it by pi to get the circumference of the stone and measure out how much metal you're gonna use. Now that works, but sometimes you're gonna to have to add more like 3.5 instead of 3.14 because it matters how thick this metal is in order to get it all the way around the stone. The easiest way I would recommend doing it is pick yourself up a mini bezel mandrel, especially if you're gonna work with a lot of small rounds, and you can either take your digital calibers and let's say your stone is 4.08 and you can go down here Put your finger there and wrap it around and that's going to be perfect you know and that'll give you the general shape and size you're going to need i just eyeball it because i've been doing it for a while and you just get used to it after a while it's not that hard you can't go wrong because you can always start up here make it a little bit smaller and if this doesn't fit your stone you just slide it down and you can make it a little bit bigger so i'm going to take this and i'm going to just pop it over the metal and this looks like it's a perfect fit. So what I like to do is before I cut, I take the stone, I flip this around. You can look at it from the front ways too. And I see how much room I'm working with. This would be essentially the perfect size because I have just a little bit of extra wiggle room. And by the time I solder everything together with the back plate, it will be a perfect fit. You don't want it too loose. It'll rattle in your setting and you don't want it too tight because it won't fit in. So I take my snip. You get these snips at Harbor and Freight. I love them for my bezel wire. You can't cut really thick metal. And you're just gonna cut that out. So now you have a small bezel. And I go back to the stone and I'm gonna pop it over. And as you can see, that is literally the perfect fit. We have a little extra room, enough to file, close it up, and this will be perfect. Okay, so now that we have that perfect size bezel. We're going to now need to file. So what I like to do is I take my chain nose flat plier and I pop it right in between the two plier heads and I squeeze down. So it makes it nice and flat, makes it easy for us to file and get it prepared for soldering. The next thing you'll do from here is just pull it apart so you get some room to file so you can get that file through there. And then you're going to take your file, and I just like to rock this back and forth. Take my time, really check. And why do I go this way a little bit? Because sometimes when you're filing straight, you think you're filing straight. At the very bottom of the metal where this should be flat, 
I'll notice that the metal will go instead of like this, where my fingernail is, it'll be like this. So instead of this, it's like this. So when I take the file and I file on an angle, it helps to get everything nice and flat. I'm just trying to do this at an angle so you guys can see. And this will come with practice. Okay, that looks about good. So let's see if we are good to go. So from here, you would take pliers. Any pliers will work. And I just create a little tension. Line it up. And then I take those same pliers, those flat pliers, and I just squeeze this together. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to check to see if any light is going to pass through that bezel because solder will not fill any kind of gaps. So you want to make sure that your seam is perfect. It'll create better working habits for you when you're creating ring shanks and all that kind of stuff to just get really nice straight seams. You don't want to rely on solder because it's not going to fill the gaps and it's going to create a weak joint if there are gaps. I have this little light right here and I turn it on, might blind you for a minute. And I just like to hold this up. Now you're not going to be able to see this, but I can. There's no light passing through this, so we're ready to solder at this point. Okay, so now we're over at my soldering station. It's a bit messy, but that's okay. You're going to want to, I have two of these that I made. You're going to want to flux these two bezel wires, and we're going to be ready to solder once we do so. You can use whatever flux you like. I'm going to be using handy flux. I learned with this. I've tried a few others, but this is my favorite. I need to add a little water to it, but that's okay. So you just want to place a very small amount of flux, and this will allow the solder to flow. So don't place it everywhere, just where that seam is. And sometimes to get in that small bezel, I'll use like an end of a matchstick or anything that you can, you know, you have laying around, and I just pop some on the inside. Take some off. Okay. This one I already fluxed. So the next thing you're going to want to do is start with hard solder. You always want to start with hard with your first solder and you can work your way down to medium and easy. This way, once you start with hard, you know that if you use medium next, this seam isn't going to come undone if you're soldering properly. You need the tiniest pallion. I like to use sheet solder, but you can use wire or you can buy the little pallions, but you need a very, very minimal amount of solder. So I have three pieces there, I only need two, but hey, you never know. I'm gonna be using a double zero tip. If you have an acetylene tank, this will work well. If you're using propane and oxygen, you use a finer tip for this particular project. So you get your torch started, we got our bezels fluxed, we have our solder cut. So what I like to do is I like to heat my solder into a little ball. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little ball on the edge of my pick. And what I like to do is fine silver is not like sterling. Sterling needs to be he heated all the way around in order for the solder to flow. Fine, you can actually just direct the heat where you want it and it's gonna flow there. But I like to give it a little heat all the way around. And then I just place my solder and it should flow. There you go, it happens that quick. Now you can place it first before you heat anything. I like to heat it up a little bit because it has this, it gives the ability for the solder to stick to the piece. So I'm going to heat the solder. I'm going to place it on the seam and it's going to flow down. And it really happens that quick. So I'll do it again, maybe facing you guys so you can see. So sometimes I do this next step um, on my bench, but I'm gonna do it here because it's just easier to film. I take my bezel mandrel that I showed before, this is why this thing rocks, and I'm gonna take my rawhide mallet, and I'm gonna take one of the bezels that we just created, and we're gonna shape this. So what I like to do is I slip it onto the mandrel, and I pull it down as far as I can, and then in order to get this completely round, as you can see it's not from shaping before to file to solder, we're going to, I lay this on my bench and I have a few grooves that it fits into. And I'm gonna whack this and hammer it out so this way it's nice and round. Now you're gonna to wanna to do this 
on a sturdy bench because if you start whacking the hell out of it, everything else will fall down. But so here we go. So I'm gonna just get these little bumps out. The camera might move a little bit. And then I just slip it off. So as you can see, we now have a round setting. A little trick in case your setting is too small. You can pop this on here and you can whack this with a metal type of hammer. You know, this way it can enlarge it. You just need a few. It's gonna distort it a little bit, but you can whack it a little bit and it's going to expand the metal and it will open it up a bit. But be careful because it will open it up a lot too quickly and then it won't fit. So we don't have to do that this time. Okay, so I have these fitting all of the stones that I already need to solder for my other project. And this is the one we just made. So I'm gonna pop this over and it's a perfect fit. I'm gonna flip it around and as you can see, perfect fit, just enough room for me to solder it onto the back plate. And let's get to our next step. Okay, so the second step would be to attach this bezel wall to a sheet of silver, sterling silver. Now, we can use 20 gauge, you can use 18 gauge, you can use 24 gauge. I don't like to use anything um, thinner than 20 gauge. A 20 gauge is my go-to, so that's what I'm using. But you can use what you can afford, um, what you want to practice on, whatever you're comfortable with. The thicker it is, the more substantial it will be. So what we wanna do is find a piece of metal that will fit that stone, which this works perfectly. When I'm doing a bunch of these, such as all of these, I will solder it all at once, but we're gonna focus on doing one at a time today. Now, I don't need this big sheet because I only am soldering that small little stone. So what I like to do is I take a Sharpie marker and I just roughly draw a little back plate I leave a little extra room. I recycle all my materials, so I'm not really too concerned. If you were working with gold, then you'd probably want to use half of that material, but you know, for me, that's just fine. And also it'll allow you, especially with practicing, it'll allow you to heat up that back plate without burning your bezel. So I just take my saw, and then I just lubricate it with a little wax, and I'm going to just cut out this back plate. When I get towards the edge, I go a little slower, just so you don't break your blade. So now that you have your back plate, what you wanna do is you're gonna to wanna to sand the bottom of the bezel wall, so this way you can have a nice, clean solder joint. You'll have no gaps, and it'll create a very flat, even surface for this to join with the solder. So as you can see, I have a piece of sandpaper. It's laid right on top of my uh, stainless steel blocks that don't look so stainless steel because they do get dirty. I have to clean them. Um, and I'm going to just pop that bezel right on top. So as you can see, we have this bezel and we're ready to sand this down. And with two fingers, I just take it and I just move it around in a circular motion. I just kind of turn the bezel wall and I do it to the other side. Now you can move it in a figure eight. I just prefer to twist it around. And that should be good. Now you can see this is nicely sanded. And the way I check to see if this is going to work, so what I would do is I would just put this up to the light, make sure that there's no light passing through the bottom. You'll be able to tell if there is any light uh, going through because the bottom surface is not flat. Everything's flat and good to go. So we're gonna pop this on our charcoal block. This is my favorite thing to solder on. So now what we're gonna do is repeat the same process as before, but we're just going to be doing different placement with the solder. So you're going to want to flux the entire back plate. I find that fluxing the entire back plate works because it protects the metal as well. And then you would just flux the bottom where you sanded. And you'll always be able to tell where you sanded because it's gonna look a bit more rough. So I just pop some flux onto there. And I'm just gonna put that bad boy right on top and I just like to, you know, give it a firm press. So this way I know everything is sealed down. We're gonna be using a medium solder. 
I always mark my solder. And you see, they always say you can't use dirty solder. I let mine out, I touch it with flux, it's fine. I don't know if everybody has the same experience, but I've been soldering for years and it works fine for me. So you don't need a lot of solder for this project because it's not a very big bezel. Okay. You can get away with using a double zero tip. And I would recommend using a double zero tip for a beginner who needs more um, control with their flame and not burning this bezel. Because if you have too much heat, you're going to end up heating this fine silver a lot quicker than this thicker 20 gauge back plate. I'm going to use a zero because that's what I do. But you can use whatever you're comfortable with. So again, I'm going to heat up this solder. Okay. And you could do one of two things. You can place the solder. Oops, I just dropped it. You could do one of two things. You can place the solder on the outside, not touching the bezel, or you could place it on the inside. I tend to place it on the outside when I want to use a clear stone. This way I can ensure no solder gets on the back plate on the inside and I don't have to clean it up. But you can put it on either way. We're going to do it on the outside today. So I heat up this back plate a bit and I'm really concentrating the heat, especially using this higher flame. Kind of on the outside, you don't need to do it so direct. My phone's ringing, but I'm going to let it go because I really want to film this. And then I'm going to heat that solder. So you're going to uh, continue to apply that heat all the way around. Now do not focus too much on the middle because then you're going to burn your bezel. And you're going to be able to tell when it's just about ready to go. Again, we're using a medium solder. And here it goes, see? It goes all the way around real quick. And then you're done. So that step is now over. We're just gonna next cut out, we're gonna pickle this, cut out the back plate, just kind of clean it up with some files or rubber wheels, and then we'll be able to create the ring shank. This is my very corroded pickle, but I promise you it does the job. So as you can see, it's a bit hot. I'm just gonna drop that in there. Some people like to say that you need to quench it in water first. That's actually how I was taught, but I find I like it better. Just straighten the pickle. You just got to be careful you don't burn yourself or get any holes in your clothing with the splash back. So drop that in there. You let it sit for a couple of minutes and you're going to take it out. And then you just put some water onto it to clean off any of the solution. And then you will be ready to go for the next step. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to cut out the back plate from the bezel and we'll be able to clean this up. Again, I'm going to be taking my saw. I'm going to lube the blade up. And these smaller ones, I find that it's, it's easier to cut them out if you have a little bit more on the back plate. So usually I just um, start, you know, anywhere and then I try to keep the blade as close to the bezel without cutting into it because then you'll form a gap and you'll cut into the setting. You just slowly turn the metal. Don't be in a rush to do this because it's only going to make your blade break or you know you'll have a mistake so as you can see there's a little extra metal that we're going to get off now there's a couple ways you can do this you can break your hands and do it with filing um, i used to do that a lot when i first started but i'll be honest with you it's just a pain in the ass in my opinion so if you want go ahead take a file and you can just you know chuck away at that or the what I do is I'm over at my polishing machine right now and this is what I like to use um, in replacement of filing. I find that this is a little bit more efficient way, especially if you're going to do production work. You can buy these uh, for, you know, your flex shaft, but I like to use my big polishing machine because it gets things done quicker. And this is a Craytex wheel. It's from Rio Grande. I will link the item number below because it's cut out from um, where the spindle goes. So what I do is I just attach this onto my spindle. You have a little glass of water because this is gonna get real hot, especially because it's small. And at this point you wanna wear protective gear, so whether it's you know a mask, eyeglasses, what have you, 
So I'm going to work my way around the bezel and take off any excess metal. I'm going to try to avoid any areas that don't really need it because I can clean that up on my flex shaft. So I'm just going to kind of go around and around. So now we're done getting most of that metal off and now we're going to go to the flex shaft and just clean this up. Now that we've done the preliminary work for removing that excess metal, we're just going to finish it up by using a rubber wheel. And they come in all sorts of grits and you can choose what you like best. Some rubber wheels other people love, I don't like, it's just what you prefer. And um, what I'm going to do is just keep that water handy um, that's in my bench right now and go around. It's really the same concept as what we were doing on the larger polishing machine. This is just with a bit of a finer wheel. It's not going to remove as much metal, it's just going to clean it up. And then we'll go on the bottom. You can use sandpaper for the bottom too, you don't have to use that. And the sandpaper will give you, um, if you use like sanding sticks, a little bit more of a uniform like circle or whatnot. So on the bigger stones you might want to do that, more expensive stones and what have you. So another step you can take is you can take like a nice fine file. I don't remember what this one is because it's covered in the handle. But you can find out where your solder is, you know, where your uh, seam is, I'm sorry. And it's right here and if there's any excess solder at this point so I'm just gonna go over this just cleaning up all that solder doesn't need to be there and then I go over it with the rubber wheel again just to smooth it out preps it for polishing Okay, so our next step is we're going to take this 14 gauge wire and we're going to make a ring shank. And this is going to be a stacking ring and it's going to be hammered. What I find for most hammered pieces, I do the hammering after it's soldered, about a size and a half smaller works best. So uh, I need to make this in a size. So if I need an eight, which I need, I'm going to go for a six and a half. That's how much metal I'm going to cut out. So I need to cut 57.8 millimeters of wire in order to get the correct sizing I need. So I'm going to take my digital calibers. We have it set at 57.8. I'm just going to take the metal. I'm going to rest one side of the caliber and then scribe the other side so I know where to cut. I'm going to take your saw and you're just going to cut this out. always falls on the ground, never fails. So now you have your ring shank and you have to just file this flat so we can solder it. Same thing when it comes to uh, soldering the ring shank as it did for the actual bezel wall. I'm just going to flatten this out because it's a little bit curved. Okay, I'm gonna show you my trick. I've shown this in some of my vlogs, but this is how I get most of my ring shanks pretty straight. You can do it, you know, leaning against the bench and filing it flat, but I find it's more accurate and a little bit quicker to do it this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 14 gauge wire, I'm going to place it inside of the vise, I'm going to turn this and close it. But you want to make sure it's nice and straight, so this way when we file we get an accurate flat line. And I'm going to take my flat file and I'm just going to run it across the top. I just check with my finger to make sure I can see that it's flat and then I just flip it over and do the other side. Okay, now I can shape this so we can begin to uh, solder and then we'll be able to uh, attach the bezel cup to the ring shank. I'm going to take my ring mandrel and this is a very relatively, not this is not thin by any means, but it's not like 16 gauge or 18 gauge. 
um, and it's not thick like, you know, a 10 gauge or, you know, a 6 gauge. So this is easy to bend around. I just take it on my mandrel and it doesn't really matter where. And I just wrap it around like so, as you can see. So I take a rawhide hammer at this point and I just kind of form the, the ring closed just enough, as you can see. Now what I'm going to do is I have this nice little shape we got going over here. Usually I would take this to my steel block and do this, but because this doesn't require a lot of pressure, I'm just going to do it right on my anvil and I just tap this down just so it meets flat like so. What I would do is I create a little tension like so. So that this way there's a nice clean joint. Now this is ready to solder. I'm obviously going to do a light check, make sure there's no light passing through. From what I can see right now, it's totally fine. So I'm going to just do the light check and then we'll be ready to solder. So we're just going to flux the ring shank and you're just going to put it right on that seam. I got to add a little water to this flux. It's a bit, it's a bit thick right now, but that's okay. And we're going to do hard again because this is a brand new project. Uh, we can start as if we didn't do that bezel cup. If you were attaching the bezel cup right now, you wouldn't be able to use hard. But since you're just going to do the ring shank, you want the strongest joint possible, especially because it gets a lot of wear. You need a very tiny, tiny bit of solder. It's not a big ring. I'm going to use a zero tip flame. Just going to light my torch. And then I'm going to light, I'm going to heat the solder up. And now I'm going to, with silver, with sterling silver, you have to evenly distribute the heat. So I'm going to heat the whole ring, and then I'm going to drop this solder right on the seam. And you're going to see it's going to happen quick. There it goes. And it's done. I'm doing the best I can angle-wise, so I hope it helps. Putting that in the pickle, and then we'll move on to our next step. So now you have your bezel cup and you have your ring shank. We're going to clean this up, we're going to make this round, flatten it out, and then hammer it out, and then we'll be able to connect the two. You're going to want to take your uh, ring mandrel and you're going to slip on the ring, and I just bring it down as far as I can get it. These are pretty easy since it's not a really, really thick wire. And then I'm going to just hammer this so that this way we get it down to a six and a half and a true round shape. And you can hammer this way too if you prefer that. Sometimes I do it, it depends. But with these I just hammer it like this. Okay, and that's out of six and a half. And what did I say before? You want about a size and a half smaller than you're going to make it, so it's going to be an eight. Now what I like to do is I take this over to my steel block and I'm going to flatten it because it could be a little bit wonky right now. I do this twice. You could do it once, but I like to do it twice. Okay, so I take my uh, steel block, that doesn't look like steel, and I put another one on top of it. You want to make sure though that, that whether these are dirty or not is irrelevant. You want to make sure there's no bumps in them. Because if there is, I tend to wrap something in like a paper towel just to protect the metal. And I'm going to give it a whack, and then I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to give it another whack. And what that's going to do is it's going to make that ring nice and flat. Okay, so the next step you're going to do is you're going to want to just clean up that solder mark. Now, two things I do. I like to use a little bit more of an abrasive file at this step because I can tell and I don't lose where my solder, where I actually soldered. So I'm going to take this file, I'm going to run it over the seam. Just get anything excess off. And now I'm going to be ready to hammer this to size. Now the reason I use the abrasive files because once we hammer this out, you're going to lose a little bit of where you cleaned it up. Now I can always tell that I'm going to want to attach my bezel cup right up top here. Now why do you want to do that? In case you ever want to resize this ring, you'll be able to because you can cut from here and solder it without really messing with the original solder mark. It's best to just leave this um, where this will touch, I find. so. You know, you could do it however you want, but that's really, I feel, the best way. So I'm going to pop this on my ring mandrel, and I'm going to hammer this out to a size eight and a half. I'm sorry, eight. I'm going to take a ball peen type hammer, and I'm going to just hammer this. 
and I just work my way all the way around. And then I flip it over just to make sure we're getting an even whack. Almost there. It's hard to hold it and try to uh, have the video captured as well. Okay, so now as you can see, it's perfectly to a size eight. Okay, so for the, for the sake of this video, I'm going to show you what I would do if um, I was working with a thicker ring shank. Normally I file a flat spot like I did with this ring, like I did with this ring, so this way I can have the most metal touching the surface area, so it's a very strong join, but I really don't worry about that because th these are relatively small components. You don't really need to, but I'm going to show you in case you want to use other bands. This is where having that um, little bit of metal filed works. You're not going to be able to see it in the camera probably too well, but right here I could tell I, I used the file. So that's where I want to make my flat spot. I'm going to just put this in there and I want to file a flat spot right here. Now you don't want to use a very big file. I would recommend using like a needle file for a project like this since this is a very small bezel cup. You know, you don't want to use something that's going to create a file mark that's, you know, eight millimeters wide when you only need it to be four or five. So I'm just going to sit here and create that spot, that nice flat spot that we want for our bezel cup to sit at. files. Okay, that looks about good. It's going to be probably a little hard to see, but there's a nice little flat spot right here where this bezel cup is going to sit perfectly. Okay, so for any type of ring setup, I like to use these third hand tweezers. You will develop your own techniques, but this is just how I'm doing it. I'm gonna take a little flux and I'm gonna to go to that flat spot we just filed, because that's where we wanna connect this bezel cup. This is very dry, this flux. It's all right. You just add a little water if your flux gets dry. Okay, so we add a little flux. So now's the point where we're going to attach this easy solder onto here and just melt the solder. This is like a preliminary step, I would say, because I like to do it separately. You don't have to, but this is how I do it. So I'm gonna heat up the silver, and this is a huge heat sink, these tweezers, so you're gonna have to give it a little bit more heat than normal. Heat up that solder. I'm gonna place it where that um, flat spot is, and then just gently wisp it, and then you see it melts. Don't go too long because it'll start spreading, especially if you put too much flux on over here. It'll, the solder will go all the way down. The solder's gonna flow where the flux had gone. So right now we have it right here and here is where I want it to be. That's where the flat spot is and that's where we're going to be attaching it to the bezel cup. I'm gonna pickle this and I'll be back. Okay, so at this point we've soldered it. We have hammered it nice and flat and I like to go in I put two little blue markings so I can tell where that solder is and where that cup needs to go in between. And from here, it's all about setup. I don't usually, for this kind of ring, I don't set it up. I don't really care about setup because I can do these freehand, meaning I just solder it like so and I place it down. But for the purpose of a tutorial, I'm going to show you. You would want to take some type of third eye tweezer and you're going to pop it in. I like to use the back because it tends to have the most stability and it doesn't slip. And that's the biggest thing. If you go over here, it tends to slip as you're heating it. So I usually stand, I'm going to zoom out. I usually stand like right here and I just look at it and adjust it. There's a little adjustable knob right here and I make sure it's straight up and down. And it is, and we're ready to solder. So I applied already flux to the bottom and I applied flux to the back plate. This is all just kind of trial and error. You know, I just place this, and then I'm gonna zoom out. 
because I'm going to show you where I go. And I go at the end of my table and I look and I see that I need to push this up because the other side, it's not even. Okay, once more, just a little bit. I'm going to take the camera off my tripod so I can show you what I'm doing. It's a bit hard to see, but when I look from this angle, I could see that the bezel cup, whether it has more room on the left or on the right. Essentially, all this is is checking and double checking for accuracy, and that's how you're going to get a great final product and not have to redo steps. Again, I'm using a zero flame. We already have the solder on the ring shank, and we're going to fire away. Now, when you're using a um, third hand, like I said, it's a heat sink. I try to concentrate most of this heat right on the band. Give a little bit to that back plate, but not too much because we don't want to melt that bezel. So this looks about good. We're about to flow in probably like 15 seconds or so. All right. Just keep evenly applying that heat. And there we go. It flowed just like that. I give a little pressure sometimes just to make sure it gets down there all the way. And now, voila, you have your very first or maybe third, or God knows how many you might have made. I'm going to pop this in the pickle, then I'm gonna show you how to sand it, set it, and then we are going to polish it and we'll be done. So congratulations if you have made it this far. It is certainly not easy to make a ring. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. Sometimes smaller things are way more intricate. Um, and if it takes you a few times to do this, don't get discouraged. It's great that you're trying and trust me, it takes a long time to get good at it and fast at it and you don't need to be fast. You just want to be accurate and practice makes perfect. So if you want to do this stuff in copper, you do that. Okay, so from here I just want to now pop the stone in. I put a piece of floss underneath it so I could take it back out. Get a good idea of how much I really need to take out uh, off with the sanding process for the metal. So I'm going to take the stone out, place that down, and just take your ring and you're just going to go around in circles. This is very gritty sandpaper so I have to go a little slower. Now I do use my grinder wheel a lot of the times for these smaller settings to grind them down quickly but I want to show you how you would do that if you didn't have a grinder. I suppose I didn't show you the other stuff without a grinder, but that's okay. Okay, we're almost there. So from here we've sanded the bezel down, and now I just want to create a very smooth finish. So you could take one of two things. You could take a, uh, like a nail file, or a filing stick. I just take my rubber wheel and I go around the top. So just like so. So I take the rubber wheel and I'm just going around where I just sanded, just the very top. Because what I'm gonna do is I just want that to be nice and smooth so when I polish it, it's not all sanded with rough sandpaper. So the next thing I do is I take these little cylinder burrs and this is just something that I kind of, I don't know, along the way like to do. I just do this with my hand, not even a flex shaft. You could do it with the flex shaft. And I just go like this to kind of get any of the excess um, metal out from sanding. And then we're ready to see if this stone actually fits and is good and low enough or if it's too high or whatnot. So I'm going to pop it in. Oh, it's perfect. So as you can see, the stone fits perfectly. Um, I just put the floss in just so I can make sure that I can take it out and we're ready to set the stone. Okay, so I tried to film this earlier um, and I it just didn't work out when I uploaded it. So I'm actually setting a different stone, but it'll be the same concept as using the ring. I will continue with the polishing footage with the ring. So I just wanted a better angle for you guys. And I think I finally found it. So what you're going to do is you're going to place it in your vise or your benchmate or your ring clamp, however you want to do it. I just like using a vise. I think I've mentioned that in my vlogs. And you can use a couple of tools to set a stone. You can use these bezel pushers. 
and it has like a nice square tip if you can see that. And um, I prefer these. I just find that I get a cleaner set. Um, I don't really love bezel rollers, which is what these are. So the head widths vary. As you can see, this one's very thin. This one's super thick. This one's brass. This is, I don't know, steel of some sort. Um, these tend to slip for me more. I just don't like them. Um, this one is actually pretty good. This one doesn't slip nearly as much as the other one. I don't have a problem, and I do use this with certain projects. Um, another form of setting, I've shown this in my vlogs, is the hammer set, which is also really great. I tend to use this only really for like heavy walled bezels and certain projects as well. So what I like to do is I take my bezel pusher, and I'm really bad with like 45 degree angle talk. So I am just going to show you guys. Um, I start north, south, east, and west, and I like to hold the stone a little bit, and I just kind of crimp the metal over. And then I move towards like the north end, and I do the same thing. I'm sorry, it's really, this is the hardest thing for me to film, I don't know why. And then you go east, and then you can go west. So you just kind of crimp the metal over, and you just keep going around until it's all done. And I usually have to take this out of the vise, I'm just kind of and twist it. And I usually just turn it around. If you have a ring clamp, you can easily turn this around. And I just really apply not too much, but you know, a lot of pressure just so it really makes um, a nice solid connection with the stone and there's no gaps. And you're just going to keep going around and doing this. Now, if you wanted to use, let's say, a bezel pusher, it's the same concept. This one feels very bent. Um, but you just kind of rock it. Same thing. It's the same concept. So you kind of want to just go in, I don't know, would you say like a 45 degree angle? I'm really terrible with math. It's embarrassing, but whatever. So you just want to go in at an angle and just kind of press it over. And you'll feel what a comfortable angle is, that you're not like touching the stone. So you're just going to go all the way around and push the metal in. And that's really it. And then next is just burnishing the stone. A lot of times before I set these stones, I pop them in the tumbler, but I just don't feel like it's a step that I really need to show. If you want to tumble your jewelry, you can, and you can just tumble finish it and it would be done. But I'm showing you how to actually polish a ring and do it from start to finish. So at this point, you just want to burnish the metal with a burnisher. And you would just have a ring clamp or against your bench pin, which I'm going to show you in a second, and you're going to apply pressure and smooth this metal all the way around the stone. So. I have to do it over here and just kind of burnish that metal and it's going to create a shine and it's also going to really secure that stone. So as you can see, the general gist, you have now completed your stone. It shouldn't move and it should be very secure in the setting. If you made it a proper size, your stone should now be secure and not wiggle and be ready for um, the final step, which is polishing. Okay, so this is where I polish all of my jewelry. I suppose I could have cleaned it up for you guys, but I'm not going to kid myself. This thing ends up looking like this, usually at some point of my week, and I do clean it. It just gets dirty quick. So try to keep the area clean, though, because otherwise it gets kind of gunked up and the filter won't work properly like it should. But I love this polishing machine. I'll link it below. I bought it from Rio Grande. And I always keep, um, let's say I'm using a gray compound, which is a more aggressive cutting, prepping for a rouge, that high shine we all are after, um, or some of us are after, you know, you want to keep the gray on one side, and any cutting compound on one side, and you want to keep your rouge on another. You don't want to like cross contaminate the two. I mean, um, some of the obviously fibers and little um, cloth hairs are going to get everywhere, but for the most part, you, I keep it separate um, just because I don't directly go from polishing my jewelry, like let's say I'm going to polish this ring, I do not go from doing the gray compound to rouge. It's going to cross contaminate them and it won't achieve, after a while this is going to get gunked up with, you know, cutting compound and it's going to kind of counteract what I'm trying to do. So uh, first what I like to do is I'm going to use gray compound on this wheel. I actually have to change this, this one's a bit small. And I'm going to prep it for the nice high shine, the red rouge. 
So first we'll do that and then I'm going to go downstairs um, and I'm just going to clean the ring. It might seem like a lot of steps, but I can promise you that you'll get a really nice high shine if you do it this way. You obviously want to wear your protective gear at this point. Um, you know, mask and all that. Right now, I'm wearing goggles. So I just attached my wheel and the gray compound that I've used, and I have a polishing video that I talked about this compound that I really like. Just making sure it's recording. It's from Rio Grande. This was a hunk and chunk and bar. I actually am finally almost through with it. So what I like to do is I turn the machine on and I'll do a voiceover at this point because I'm not going to be able to talk and you won't be able to hear me. Okay, so now we're polishing, and you're going to want to keep your arms, this is a really important thing when polishing, very close to your sides, and keep a firm grip on your ring or your pendant or whatever you're polishing, because easily this can slip right under the wheel and go flying. Now you want to keep the ring towards the bottom of the wheel, not in the middle like that. I'm showing you don't do that, because it's going to slip and it's going to grab it and want to take the ring and distort it, break it lose a finger, what have you. So keep it on the bottom of the of the wheel. You'll feel what's comfortable and what won't grab as much. And this will give you a really nice even polish and it'll feel comfortable in your hands. It takes a little bit of practice to get used to being comfortable. Right now I am hitting the top of the bezel. I'm going around the sides right there. You want to hit all angles of the ring to make sure that you get a really nice even polish. The more pre-finishing you do, the less polishing you'll have to do at this point. But um, yeah, so it's pretty much just kind of hitting everything and all the surfaces and that will prep it to go on to the next stage of rouge. So sorry, this is really the best I could do with what I'm working with as far as um, angles go, but you make sure that, just make sure that when you're polishing, you really want to hit the tops, the sides, want to hit the bezel. And I recommend I know it's a lot of steps, but I like to polish before I oxidize. It takes to the liver of sulfur much, much better when the metal is actually prepped and cleaned as opposed to just pickling and then dumping it in the liver of sulfur. But you can also do that. It's not wrong. It's just will probably give you a more rustic and less finished appearance. Um, if you just do a little bit of cleanup and sanding, you can skip doing this if you're going to do liver of sulfur. But see, now you have this really nice high shine. Um, and this is just the prep work. We still have to put the rouge on it. So the next thing also you can do is I like to do all of my inside of my ring shanks at my bench. I use my flex shaft. I don't like to use my big polisher for it. Um, sometimes I do, but very rarely. And it's not really a ton of work to do it at the bench and I find I just have more control. So you would just use your um, gray wheel. I don't need to put any more compound on it because this one has enough. And you literally just take the ring and you just run it around the inside. So now the inside has nice gray prepping and we're ready to clean this. Now how I clean it is all you have to do is I put usually about just a little bit of water. This is the only step I'm really not going to show, um, just like the pickling. To clean the, the gray off, I use palm olive. That's like my tried and true. I've shown it in a vlog before, I'm pretty sure. I like palm olive the best. I don't know why. It just removes the compound much easier than some of the other cheaper soaps or just other soaps like Dawn. And I use a toothbrush. I have hard ones and I have soft ones depending on my project. And I just brush it with hot, hot soapy water. And I just clean it off and it's going to remove any gray that's remaining and get all the cracks and crevices and it gets it ready for the rouge. So now we are all done and set to uh, apply the rouge to our polishing wheel and clean this bad boy up. Basically at this point, um, it's been cleaned with the toothbrush. Like I said, all you have to do is go out by yourself like a soft toothbrush and like a medium one. The medium ones get under the bezel cup really well to get rid of that gray grime that the polishing compound tends to build up there. And then the soft one just to kind of brush the metal and get rid of all of that previous compound that we just used in prepping now for the rouge. So I'm going to use this side of my polishing wheel and I'm going to use my Rio Grande Sunsheen Polishing uh, Compound. This is Red Rouge. And you can use other stuff. I like also Zam. I use that often too. But I primarily use Red Rouge. So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn this on and just do the same steps and make sure that we hit all points such as the bezel and the sides and the main part of the shank. So I'm 
back over at my bench and I'm just going to do the last polishing step and this is going to be the finale uh, for just cleaning up the ring and I'm going to apply my rouge wheel just like you have different wheels on your big polishing uh, machine you want to put different wheels on your flex shaft and I have actually a piece of rouge here so I usually keep uh, the gr I only have one gray one right now so I share it so I just apply a little bit on that wheel and then I go around and around we go so now this is all ready to be dunked into the soap and water again and will be finished. So I'll show you guys what it looks like. It'll probably look pretty similar to the gray. It's hard to pick up on camera. Okay, so this is the ring all finished and polished. As you can see, it has a really nice lustrous effect to it. I feel like on camera it's a bit harder to tell um, how polished it really is, but if you can see that like really nice glistening effect. I hope this tutorial helped. Again, I don't know if I'll make a lot of tutorials because it's very difficult to get angles right so you guys can actually see what I'm doing, but I hope this helped you guys. Okay, so if you guys have any questions or comments, just leave them below. I try to get back to everybody if I can't. Um, you can always tweet me on Twitter, um, at Designs or follow me on Instagram. And yeah, so thanks so much, and I will speak to you guys soon.